Once we were going to the place of prayer, and we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future, and she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. And she kept this up for many days. And finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. And when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. And they brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. And the jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And he then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and then immediately he and all of his household were baptized. And the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So a woman goes to a doctor who verifies that she is, in fact, pregnant. Like my daughter Jillian recently and our other daughter Jessica come July, this woman finds out that she's going to be a first-time mom. So the doctor asks her if she has any questions, to which she replies, well, I am a little worried uh, about the pain. How much pain is involved with childbirth? Is it going to hurt? And the doctor answered, you know, well, that varies from, from woman to woman. Besides, it's, it's sort of difficult to describe pain. Uh, I know, but, but, but you know, can't you give me some idea, she asked. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's try this, said, said the doctor. Grab your upper lip and, and pull it out a little. Like, like this? Uh, a little more. Like, like this? No, a little more. L- l- like this? Yeah, does it hurt? Well, a, a, a little bit. Good. Now stretch your lip up over top of your head, and that'll just about do it. My dear wife, Cindy, and I, we have three children, all of whom are now heading into their childbearing and rearing years, and as those of you moms who have had more than one child know full well, parenthood, it it has a way of changing you. So I wondered this week what my dear wife Cindy might pass on to our kids on a variety of parental topics. How about clothing? She'd probably say, for your first baby, you begin wearing your maternity clothes as soon as your OBGYN confirms that you're pregnant. For for the second, you wear your regular clothes for as long as possible. But by the third kid, your maternity clothes are your regular (laughs) clothes. How about baby names? For for the first child, you pour over piles of baby name books. You even practice pronouncing and writing combinations of your favorite. For your second baby, you you know, someone has to name their kid after their great Aunt Beulah, right? Right? It might as well be, be you. And by the third kid, you, you open a, a name book up and you close your eyes and you see where your finger lands on the page. Okay, Bimaldo. Perfect. You know, sound, sounds great. 
how about preparing for, for birth? For the first baby, you practice your breathing religiously. Uh, for, for the second, why bother? Because you remember the last time that breathing didn't do a blessed thing. <laughs> and by the third kid, you ask for an epidural in the eighth month. <laughs> how about getting the layette ready? You know about what a layette is, guys. For the first child, my wife would say, you, you, you pre-wash all the newborn's clothes, you color coordinate them, you fold them neatly. For the second, you will throw away anything that's badly stained. And by the third kid, you say, you know, boys can wear pink too, <laughs> right? How about child rearing worries? You know, for the first baby, well, at the first sign of distress, you snatch them up for fear of the worst. For the second, you pick them up only when they wail so loud that there's a danger of them waking up the first child. And by the third, you teach your three-year-old three how to be able to wind the mechanical swing. Yeah, there's all kinds of things, moms, that are, are part of being a parent that you could probably pass on to the young mothers here today. As you may recall from last Sunday, we looked into the life of a wonderful woman of faith. Her name was Lydia uh, from uh, Acts chapter 16. And today, we're looking just a few verses later in that same chapter. We're going to be looking today into the lives of the Apostle Paul and his companion in the ministry, Silas. And hopefully, what we'll glean from today are some principles that I think have a wonderful application not just for, for moms, for mothers, but I, I, I hope for us all. And as we chuckled about a minute ago, moms, there are times when, yeah, you may feel like you are in prison. Raising kids can be a real challenge. But, but let's see today what Paul and Silas went through. And, and as we do, let's reflect on their example. What might it have to teach us? You know, as uh, we saw last week when we met Lydia, Paul and Silas, they're still in the same town in Philippi. But since then, things have changed just a smidge because now as we meet up with them, they don't feel like they're in prison, moms. They actually are in prison. Uh, they've been savagely beaten. Uh, they have been put behind bars. And now an unusual experience begins to happen. But guess what? If you are a disciple, it's not unusual. It's kind of like an everyday thing, uh, being put behind bars for these early believers. Uh, they face all kinds of hardships uh, for their faith. And yet, as we're going to see, how did they learn to handle these circumstances? I think they did in a most magnificent way. In fact, I think you and I can learn from how people like Paul and Silas dealt with these trials. How can what Paul and Silas did, their example, help us to find some help for ourselves when we find ourselves in adverse circumstances? Friends, I want you to notice today three attributes from the book of Acts that all begin with the letter A, they have to do with Paul and Silas's attitudes, as well as their actions, as well as the effects or impact that they had on those who observed them. And as we'll hopefully discover, these three A's lived out on a daily basis in our lives can have an amazing impact on those who are watching us. Let's begin, first of all, with their attitudes. And to do that, perhaps we need to kind of go back to the backstory. And as we read, Paul and Silas, they've delivered this slave girl from some kind of an evil spirit that has allowed her masters to use her as a fortune teller. We don't know what kind of a spirit this was. We know that it was not of the Lord. But what we do know is that her owners were making a good bit of income off of this girl's strange gift. Now, of course, in today's culture, it's a bit different. Folks these days seem to get easily offended when we as Christians try to, to let our lights shine in almost any arena. But 
there in Philippi, nobody seemed to mind in such a pluralistic religious landscape if you as a Christian went about trying to let your light shine, unless, that is, it interfered with commerce. And if that happened, then things got a bit testy. Yeah, it seems when the slave girl's owners realized that they were no longer going to be able to make any money off of her, they proceeded to seize Paul and Silas and they drug them there into the marketplace to face the authorities and soon enough this, this mob gathers around supporting the owners and at this sign of, shall we call it unrest, the not so courageous Town magistrates order Paul and Silas to be stripped and, and beaten with rods and, and, and then flogged and thrown into prison. Their feet are put into the stocks and the jailer commands that they are to be guarded carefully. Folks, that's life in the early church. Not an easy thing. Sounds like a typical mom's day, doesn't it? So how do Paul and Silas respond to this adverse situation. I think quite nicely, as it turns out. The writer of Acts tells us that about midnight, Paul and Silas, they were praying and they were singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners are, are, are listening to them. I mean, can you imagine that kind of an attitude? What kind of a faith would you have to have had to have been beaten and then thrown into prison and then just a few hours later, you, you begin to break out in song. I don't know about you, but, but I suspect that if that had been one of us, that we would have been curled up in a fetal position over in the corner, whining to God that somehow we wanted our mommies. Not Paul and Silas. No offense to Paul and Silas's moms, but instead... What are they doing? They're, they're, they're singing hymns. Now, now, you may have noticed that on occasion, once in a great while, I, I like to break out in song. <laughs> but not in prison. Folks, I've spent my fair share of times in prison as a pastor. And I can't ever remember being tempted to break out in song unless I'm leading a worship service there. Like most of you, I got to admit, I'm the kind of guy who worries when sickness strikes or when someone I love is in distress. I got to admit that I look at our church offering numbers from time to time, you know, where we stand in relationship to our budget. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to notice. It's, it's there in the bulletin, right? We're a bit under. Yeah, just like all of you when funds are running short in your households. I wonder, is there going to be resources to pay the bills, to, to do the work of God? Yeah, sometimes my faith, I've got to admit, is weak. I have to confess that there are times in which my fears and doubts put me in chains like Paul and Silas. And no, I realize that, that such things are nothing like what Paul and Silas were going through. And yet, maybe, maybe you know what I'm talking about here. Maybe you've had your own prison experiences, worries over a struggling marriage, a teenager who's maybe fallen in with the wrong crowd, a job that's disappeared thanks to a weak economy, a word of bad diagnosis that spells out an uncertain future. Yeah, there are all kinds of prison experiences in life. And I don't know what yours may be. Feeling hemmed in, feeling exhausted from the daily grind of being a stay-at-home mom, uh, an oppressive work environment, maybe at the office, rising costs and diminishing assets. And yet, let me ask you, in the middle of your prison time, are you able to sing? Perhaps you should. Yeah, I know well, Paul and Silas, 
They likely never read a book on biofeedback, and yet experts in that field, they, they tell us that when we express a positive action, it produces a positive emotion. Yeah, experts, they, they tell us people don't smile because they feel good. They feel good because they smile. Get my points? Let's take a study done at Wake Forest University where it was discovered that singing aloud is, is one of those positive actions that, that gets our endorphins kicking in and, and increases our sense of well-being. So when you're in prison, when you're depressed, when it seems everything that you are trying is, is failing, when you are about to lose hope, yeah, sometimes we, we have to force ourselves Paul and Silas did to break out in song. Sometimes, to use a modern day expression, we have to fake it till we make it. Try singing a praise song to God. Get your, your eyes off of your circumstances and back onto God. And then see if that doesn't help you gain some much needed perspective and help you feel better about your situation. And honestly, I, I doubt that biofeedback is the reason that Paul and Silas were singing. I mean, likely they were such people of faith that their songs were a statement of their confidence in God. And yet, those songs, they were a witness, weren't they, to the other prisoners? In fact, the writer of Acts, he makes a point of telling us that the other prisoners, they, they were listening in. Could that be one reason that Paul and Silas were singing? As a witness, you know, folks, one of the great stories from the lives of the saints of God in days gone by, it tells of a perilous voyage from London to a colony here in America called Georgia, where two young Anglican preachers found themselves trapped on a small ship in the middle of the ocean in a big storm. And it seems that they, along with the rest of the passengers and the crew, they feared for their very lives. However, there was one exception to all that panic on board. It was a band of Moravian Christians who spent that entire storm singing hymns and praising God. And as a result, those two young Anglican preachers were so impressed by the faith of these Moravians that when they did get back to London, and they did, they began to worship with the Moravians. And one night at a service on Aldersgate Street, one of those young men experienced what he called a strange warming of the heart. His name, John Wesley who would go on to become one of the most effective evangelists of the 18th century. In fact, as many of you know, he ended up founding the Methodist Church that brought literally millions of people into a relationship with Jesus Christ, including being the rock from which this church was hewn, just down the Blue Star Highway a bit in Ganges. Yeah, no small part. We are here today, folks, because a frightened young man named John Wesley was inspired by the singing of other Christians in a difficult moment. And, and that's a reminder, singing, praising God, even amidst one of life's storms or in one of life's prisons or in a battle with cancer or whatever it may be, can be a powerful witness to impressionable minds who are watching us. And folks, to continue the story, Paul and Silas are there singing hymns in, in prison. That's their attitude, our, our first A from today's lesson. And yet as verse 26 goes on to remind us, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken and at once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. As Elvis might have put it, folks, talk about a jailhouse rock. Yeah, yeah. Think about last week's sermon. 
I want you to notice that here there was nowhere in any way does it, does it mention in the story from Acts that God caused this earthquake. Yeah, you and I, we may choose to believe that, that God caused that earthquake. After all, it did just conveniently liberate these men of God from prison. And sure, it just happened to happen at the very time that they were singing, but there was no coincidence in all of that. But for our purposes right now, as good as that point is, what's really important, second of all, notice Paul and Silas's actions. Because when that earthquake occurs, notice that they didn't try to escape. They didn't try to, to run like you and I may have done. Yeah, Paul and, and, and Silas have this amazing faith. And why? It's because they, they know that God was with them. Regardless of their circumstances, they don't panic when one of life's earthquakes comes knocking at their door. Neither do they take off running with some sort of a knee-jerk reaction when the cell doors come springing out. Hey, I'm out of here. And why? It's because I think they were concerned about that jailer, believe it or not. After all, the guy had been ordered to keep a close eye on them. They were his responsibility. If they escaped, this guy was in deep doo-doo. Yeah. We see that here in this story. With all the racket, with all the, the commotion of the earthquake, the jailer wakes up, and when he sees that the prison doors are flung open, he, he draws his sword, and, and he's ready to commit Harry Carey because he thinks the prisoners have escaped. As I like to think of it, he does a Fred Sanford. Take me. Elizabeth, I'm, I'm coming to meet you. So Paul, sort of like those microscopic creatures, you remember them from that, that Dr. Seuss cartoon, Horton Hears a Who, he cries out, we're here, we're here, we're here. Hey, don't hurt yourself. Despite all the jailhouse rocking and rolling, Elvis has not left the building. And no. This is not typical behavior for prisoners in jail. These are the actions of people who are at peace with God. Let's take James Clark. He's from Wildsville, Louisiana. He tells of taking some flying lessons some time back, and his instructor told him to put the plane into this steep, extended dive. But, but Clark says that he was totally unprepared for what would happen next. It seems after a brief moment, the engine then stalled and the plane began to plunge out of control and it soon became evident that the instructor was not going to pull his fat out of the fire. And so after a few seconds, which seemed like an eternity, Clark says that his mind began to function again and so quickly he corrected the whole situation. But after doing so, as you and I might do, he turned to his instructor and he began to vent out all of that pent-out fear upon the guy. And yet in response, what he recalls is the instructor saying to him very calmly, there is no position that you can get this plane into that I cannot get us out of. If you want to learn to fly this plane, then fly back up there and let's do it again. And you know what? At that moment, Clark says that God seemed to say to him, Jim, remember this. As you serve me, there is no situation that you can get yourself into that I can't get you out of. If you trust me, you will be. All right. And folks, that's the kind of faith that Paul and Silas had. They didn't panic. They didn't run. In fact, out of their godly concern for the jailer, they ended up staying right where they were, even though that was where they maybe preferred to not be. And yeah, that's a reality, folks, that sometimes God puts us in places in our lives for a season that if we had our choice that we would prefer not to be there but he says to us 
I want you to grow where you are planted for this season until that time that you have grown enough that I will transplant you to that place that I have for you next. <laughs> and boy, do I know something about that. And maybe some of you moms do too. You can look back on your life and you can wish that, that certain seasons would hurry up and, and get over with. Maybe when your kids are little, but, but now, years later, you would pay all of the tea in China to be able to go back to that time, wouldn't you? Folks, we've seen in this adverse moment of imprisonment and, and earthquakes, the disciples' attitude, singing in prison, and we've witnessed their actions, trusting God. They remained where they were planted until God said, move. But now let's notice their effect, their impact on others. As we continue on with our story, of course, the jailer wakes up and he sees that the prison doors are wide open and he draws his sword to do what he knows he must do. Otherwise, the Roman bosses are going to do it for him. But Paul shouts out, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And at this, the jailer calls for lights and he rushes in and trembling, he falls before Paul and Silas and then he asks, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And let's recall, folks, that the jailer had seen their attitudes in this deplorable situation. He had seen their actions, the, action, the actions of men of integrity and faith. And so naturally, he, he says to them, hey, I, I want what you've got. I want some of that. And folks, that's evangelism in its purest form. But let's notice that the jailer wasn't attracted to what they had because they had knocked on his door from some evangelistic campaign. And it wasn't because the disciples had confronted him and asked him, you know, if you were to die tonight, do you know where you would go, to heaven or hell, mister? No. It was because he saw that Paul and Silas not only talked the talk, but they walked the walk. He could see by their attitudes and, and their actions that they were servants of the living God. And he wanted to be one too. Sir, what must I do to be saved? Yeah. Paul and Silas, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And then they spoke the word of God to him and to all the others in his house. And that very night, the jailer took them and he washed their wounds. And immediately he and his whole household, they were baptized. And folks, I want you to notice the difference between Paul's conversion and this jailer's conversion. You see, when Paul was, was converted, there was this blinding light and, and Paul heard the very voice of Jesus speaking to him. It was this big dramatic and traumatic experience. But the poor jailer, he didn't, he didn't have that kind of an experience. In his case, he was simply exposed to the attitudes and the actions of two genuinely Christian people. And that was enough for him to decide to become a Christ follower. And folks, that's how most people come to Christ. Faith is caught far more than it is taught. Folks don't generally come to Christ because they've had some dramatic experience. They, they come to Christ because some other ordinary, everyday Christian's faith went viral. Yeah. These ordinary Christians lived out their faith in such a way that folks around them get affected and infected with it. Yeah. Today is Mother's Day. And truth be told, many of us, including me, myself, and I, are here today because of the impact that our mothers had on us. You know, as we wrap up, some years ago, a lady named Ruth Simmons became the president of Smith College, one of the country's most elite higher learning institutes for women. And it seems that Simmons is the great-great-granddaughter of slaves. 
Apparently, she began her journey to the presidency of Smith College on a cotton farm in Grapeland, Texas, where her parents were sharecroppers. And later that family, they would, would move to a, a poor section of, of Houston, and there her father would work in a factory while her mama scrubbed floors for the white folks. So how did such humble beginnings spawn a career that led to the top of academia? I had a remarkable mother, says Simmons, and she would sometimes take me to work with her. And the thing I remember vividly has, is how good she was at what she did. She was very demanding in terms of her standards. Do it well. Whatever you do or don't do it at all, she would say. In fact, at her inauguration, President Smith carried a Bible that her mother had given her father on the day that they were married. And she said, I know the board of trustees might think I'm trying to live up to the standards that they've set for me. And that's okay. But actually, I'm trying to live up to a higher standard. Every day that I am here, I'm here trying to be the kind of person my mother would have wanted me to be. Dear ones, some of you had a mother just like that. And even if you didn't, most of you are here because you were exposed to someone who did their best to live like Jesus. You saw something in their attitudes and their actions that so affected you that it made you say, I want some of that. That's the way it works. So let me ask you, would your actions and would your attitudes cause someone to want to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Yeah, moms and dads and grandparents and neighbors and work associates and friends, being effective witnesses of Jesus, that isn't rocket surgery. It's about just living out your faith daily, regardless of your circumstances, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. Because sooner or later, you'll be having an impact on those who are listening watching you as you live through the storms and the earthquakes of life. Three A's from Acts that had an impact. Let's pray. Father, on this Mother's Day, thank you for moms whose lives impact us whose attitudes and actions and effect made a difference in our lives. Call us to such an impact on the generations to come. And we will give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.